Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. Welcome back. Welcome back out there. Um, I'm Todd London. I'm Mark Valdez. And we are holding uh, the art part today. Uh, today, <laughs> two <laughs> oops, <laughs> two person uh, theater conference today. Um, if you were with us the last half hour, we were talking about art and love, particularly our own love for the art of theater. We're now going to talk about um, ensemble practice and group art uh, and start getting into it. I uh, want to say thank you again to HowlRound for live streaming us. Thanks, HowlRound. And, to, um, and we're in... Art Changes, uh, Roberta Uno, uh, amazing program, check it out. And uh, we're here at NYU. Um, in the Cooper, Unit, Cooper, Cooper, Cooper Square. Square. Um, and also to let you know that, uh, to reconfirm that we have a May Day art part challenge and we are hoping that this conversation, our conversation, is merely catalytic for other conversations like it. So let us know through HowlRound, Twitter, or Facebook, HowlRound Facebook, or the art part at HowlRound.com if you're willing to, um, or eager to have a conversation of your own in private or public. Um, and and I, I would just yeah. add on to that, you know, just the reminder that, you know, this is a, a private conversation that we're having publicly, yeah. and they, it only represents our passions and our love and our interests, and we're, we're, we're not positioning ourselves as any kind of experts other than people who care about this field and this work, uh, who love it deeply, and uh, who just want to spend more time talking about art. Yeah, and with each other, which sort of brings us into the next uh, part of this, because I feel like Mark and I have begun these conversations together many times, because we do, as he said last hour, we find ourselves on panels together and in rooms together, and... Um, the conversations about the art we love happen so interstitially that we just wanted to give ourselves time and create a structure for ourselves and to encourage other people to do the same thing. Uh, this is never meant to be a two-person lecture. Totally, not at all. Um, so, Mr. Expert. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, so, uh, this section is um, really about group work and and in a way it was the genesis for our discussion uh, mark and i were in a room uh talking about uh supporting works of ensemble and um he asked a question about uh how do you maintain artistic practice over time and develop that practice and we both were aware that the questions um or the follow-up, the answers to that question were very much about survival and not about the work itself, the practice, the generations of practice, and so on. So uh, we want to dig into that a little bit. So I'm going to start a little bit didactically here just right. to ask you to, to define some terms, if you would. Sure. And I, I, um, I ask you in the role for like two seconds, I just ask you to be the expert that you are, having spent how many years as executive director of the Network of Ensemble like Theaters? Six or seven. Six or seven, yeah. during which you had to really come to terms with what is an ensemble, what is group creation, um, what is practice, aesthetic yeah. practice. Yeah. So can you talk us through a little bit like first, what is an ensemble? Sure, I mean, I, I guess it's really important to say, especially since we're talking about group work, that group work happens in, in groups. And so even things like the definition of ensemble or these definitions of practice, so much of it had been done by the membership before I even got there. And, and so there was a groundwork that was already well in place that included definitions and a value statement and a vision statement and, and manifestos. And, you know, because as, as ensembles are want, like just think really big and uh, ambitiously. And so, so, so you know what I what I'm repeating is is not of my making, but but that was created by a lot of other people and groups. So, uh, so for Net, um, we we defined ensemble as a group of two or more people who create um, over time, who who uh, pursue a, a specific practice over time um, to uh, to build a body of work. Hmm. So it's pretty. It's a pretty broad, broad. definition. It's numbers, 
practice and time. And, time. Uh -huh. um, and uh, so that's good. I think that's, we can just leave it at that for yeah. now. Um, so uh, tell me about what drew you to that particular work. In the last hour, you were talking about seeing an Eric N. piece at Undermain Theater and it being an ensemble piece, but also that's a very voicey playwright. So um, what led you to ensemble work? And, and this is not, uh, this is really meant to lead us into a conversation about what is particular and unique and powerful about ensemble practice. Yeah, and, and to the practice piece, you know, I, I guess like for me, it's more than just a methodology. Like, like it, it, it's, um, it has to do with values, it has to do with a vision, it, it's it's a bit more it's a bit um, bigger than just a how to or just the steps that you take in in making work. So I think I think practice for me has um, bigger implications because it kind of a, a, a bigger impact occupies more space uh, uh, than just a, a methodology. And there's nothing wrong with methodologies like they're great. Right. Uh, um, Can you describe the contours of that bigger space a little? Yeah, I mean, and I guess, I guess to that, like, like why, like the attraction to to ensembles is um, there's something for me about working with a group of people that that share like some core um, values and principles and interests, but you know, are are each individuals in their own rights with their own kind of preferences and tastes and and ideas and opinions and uh, and there's something when you have to put it together and and I think that's where the the, the larger those those contours really start to matter uh, in that um, there's a process a methodology that might be in place but the the contours and, and what, what gets shaped and developed by these specific people who work together over time. So you, you, can, you can get places quicker. You can, you can uh, start to build, the, the, you build on what, ha what came before in ways that, that are often really useful, but, but acknowledging that in ways sometimes it can be a little dysfunctional. Uh, uh, or, or or difficult because you, know, you know you know how to push someone's buttons in, in ways that uh, right. you know, because it's family and 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 so there's something about like that practice uh, that that way of working that commitment to working towards towards something and and it's not just a finished product but it's the so the th it's that it's going back to, to kind of that love piece like why are we doing this at all like why why are we doing this to begin with you know that you always kind of inevitably end up circling back to by virtue of we have to reaffirm why this group of people is here this time uh, and why we're going to do it again and and we don't want to do it just again but but why why this now and how so it's not enough to have individual commitments you have to reaffirm and clarify and uh, allow to evolve your shared commitment. Yeah. Um, so l just to, to stay with this notion, I mean, we're talking about art, but also um, process around art. Can you, um, uh, while I'm asking you questions, <laughs> um, can you talk about maybe two different ensembles in the way they might um, create so something. So I guess what I'm asking about is this notion of different commitments to different ways of working also create different fruit, right? Yeah. So like Cornerstone, and maybe yeah. is there another company yeah. that you know that different ways make different ends? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, something that, that you and I have talked about before, and it's like that connection between process and aesthetics. And how, how the like, like for me the process yields the aesthetic, and if you make something in a certain way, it's bound to be reflected in what the finished thing is, you know, in, in what it looks like and what it feels like. And so uh, I think about the the, the, the cornerstone example uh, of of a company that works in with uh, communities to create plays for and about the community. Uh, 
with uh, with an ongoing ensemble of actors. But but in, in a lot of ways, it's it's a very playwright driven company, um, and and so the stories uh, get filtered through this one voice, mm. with questions and input and support from the ensemble, and definitely with agency and input from the community. But always, always filtered through through the, the singular voice, mm -hmm. and 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 so the the plays have this wonderful. I don't know if you've, if you've seen a course on play, but but there's the there's a great mix of what is familiar playwright driven theater, at the same time as a um, a joy uh, an, an an agency ownership something that just feels really specific to the place and the people and the community in a way that um, feels highly collaborative even though it was kind of filtered for, through, through a single voice. And so, so there's something about that, that practice, that process right. that yields a very specific experience. Right. And can't be replicated by another group that just decides to go in to community. No, or exactly. Work with the yeah. for and the other people time. do. You know what I mean? Like other people work in communities. Cornerstone's not the only one. And and it's um but but the thing that makes a cornerstone play feel like a cornerstone play is that combination of it's these individuals who've been working together for thirty years, some of them, you know, kind of pushing the the limits of this methodology, this way of working and inviting new people to come in and and, and, and so it's highly dynamic and in some ways gets reinvented every time. Yeah. And then I think about like a theater like Double Edge, who, who you referred to earlier. So this is a company in, in uh, rural uh, western Massachusetts, I, I live on a farm. Kind of the, the theater is, is headquartered on this farm. And, uh, and here's a company that is committed to living together, to working together, and most importantly, to training together. And this training piece feels so key and central. Like, like you've seen their work. Like, I'm curious. Yeah. Like, 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 you know, I'm aware that I'm, I'm talking a lot. So, like, no, it's how great. do you pick up on that? You know what I mean? Like, well, no, it's very interesting. I mean, in a way, it's a good. Um, the the double example is good because Cornerstone. Um, I have experienced that sort of joy and discovery and jangle of having community actors with the professional actors of the kind of hyper-locality that this is about our place or this is about our issues or this is about our mosque or whatever um, and also the, the playwright's voice in it. Double Edge, oh, such a beautiful theater and you can feel in a way in their work the whole history of their training. So you can feel this kind of um, Grotowski physical theater impulse. And then you can also feel, and this is where I, your description of ensemble as a collection of individuals actually really comes in. I feel in their work in a way the impact of every individual who's part of making it. So Stacey C. Klein, who is the visionary artistic director of the company, but then um, Matthew Glassman, who joined later, though still 17 years ago or something, who brings a kind of philosophical questioning to the work. Carlos, who um, brings uh, both the stories of his Latin American upbringing, but also a whole different kind of presentational style. The circus work that they've done and continue to do so. There's a way in which when you see a double edge play, it's almost, in, even though it's deeply rooted in their community in Ash Ashfield, Massachusetts, and they work with communities, it's also um, steeped in this virtuosity of totally. multiple influences mm -hmm. that they have trained and developed together over 36 years or however and they, long. And in that way, they, they, they remind me like of a, a like city company. Like they, there's these, these yeah. companies that just, they commit, the, the, the training piece. Del Art. Totally, you know, like, like they, you know, and it's the, there's something about the rigor of practice, there's the rigor of just getting back into a studio and just trying again and pushing further and testing limits and, 
and uh, and deepening the deepening connection and the w and execution that that really is like in some ways is technical and beautifully like like please let us pay attention to the technical mm -hmm. uh, and and yet it, it's to to commit to that you know like so Stacy for for thirty years you know like to commit to living on a farm in rural Massachusetts and train every day. You know, talk about love. Yeah. I mean, yeah. like, there's, like, deep, like, you don't do that for, for anything other than just love. Well, the money. Oh, <laughs> yes, <laughs> all sense of them. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. Um, well, you know, it's interesting. So let me, um, so uh, I'm thinking about what are the edges of ensemble in a way yeah. because every time you create a play, you put together a company. Absolutely. But... But even those with longer bodies of work, like a Steppenwolf or a Bloomsburg, we heard from Laurie McCants before, companies that essentially do plays, mm -hmm. they do seasons, mm -hmm. um, are they still part, I mean, what makes them ensembles, what is the through line of artistic practice, and do they have the same, this is too many questions, but I'm going to throw them out, do they have the same a kind of uh, ongoing methodology, or are they simply a simply complicatedly <laughs> a group of artists communi um, committed to each other? Mm -hmm. So where does artistic practice? Come yeah, in? I mean, I, I think that the, I think you know, there's as many practices as there are ensembles, right? And so just to kind of acknowledge that. But I, I think for I think for a lot of the the companies that uh, the ensembles who take on uh, existing published canon work, uh, I think a lot of it is the commitment to one another and what that does to aesthetics and what does that does to practice of when you when you know I'm going to be back in this in the room with with this person on this next project, uh, the the uh, there's also part of it that is the the agency to self determine of of a, you know artists who so who can you know it's it's it's, it's easy to feel um, that um, that somebody else controls your fate, somebody else decides the season, somebody else decides who's in it, and 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 you're just kind of you you're just auditioning right yeah and uh and there's something about the 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 commitment to say we're going to we're going to commit to one another and we will we will make these decisions together and 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 we have a love for this way of making work which is taking a script that exists and and bringing that to life and so that is its own practice and its, its own way of making that is that is different and I, I think you know I, I'm glad you brought that up because I think that that way of working doesn't always get um, called up in um, in in when we think about ensembles we, we we often think about devised work or original work um, but uh, but I think that's part of that's part of the practice and uh, and and that does feel Feels it, it, it's in my mind, it's connected, but it's a different way of working than, say, like a fully devised mm -hmm. company. Yeah, it's interesting. When I was I was at New Dramatists, which is a seven-year residency program for playwrights and a laboratory theater, and we always, uh, over the 18 years I was there, it felt like we were always trying to find better language to describe what it was. And at some point, I realized that in my mind... Uh, at least, um, this was a, a playwright ensemble. Yes. Because for yeah. seven years that each was there, they weren't committed. Th the body of work that they were committed to was everybody's within yeah. that community. Their practices were distinct. Their voices were distinct, though there were shared structures and procedures and processes within the organization yeah. But maybe that's maybe that's wrong to call it an ensemble. I, you know, I, 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 I tend to want to be as generous with the term ensemble uh, than than not, because uh, I think about like that, that definition of like two more ensemble, like two more people, and I think I can, you know, I can think of a couple of people who are two people with formal ensembles. Yeah. Uh, I can think of people who come together. So, so the, one of the things that we've often talked about is 
there's this commitment to like like the challenge of keeping a company together yeah in an ongoing way and there are also ensembles who um who can't like like it's just too much you can't you can't sustain an everyday year round employment or or kind of project that that people go they they come together kind of re reconstitute the ensemble make a project then disband while everybody goes and does their thing and then they'll come together for their next project mm -hmm. and and there's something in that as we think about um aesthetics and sustainability like how sustainable is that mm -hmm. um and and what how does that do to practice sustainable correct as opposed to the organization correct well i mean i i think it, i think it, it it comes out of an organ like a, a financial organizational sustainability mm -hmm. if you don't have to pay for everybody every week you know if you don't yeah. you're not providing 52 weeks of employment yeah. but i think um but i one of the questions of where we where, where kind of got us here in this first place is what happens to practice what happens to aesthetics if you can't if you can't sustain it regularly yeah if you're if you know and 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 is that okay like i maybe like like i you know i i don't i don't i don't know yeah. but it does make me wonder like like Right. It has to, at some level, have some kind of impact, and what is that? Right, and what is the r the kind of working rhythm of the company? I mean, um, I guess I think about it in two ways, this notion of sustaining, because now I'm thinking about aging ensembles. Yes. And, you know, whether we're talking about John O'Neill retiring from Junebug or Carpetbag Players or Dell Art or Talking Band, um, you know, these are... Uh, companies with a commitment of sand glass within the family of sand glass um, these are companies that have a commitment to carrying on and passing on but each generation has a different commitment to the longevity of the work and the body of work so what I've uh, witnessed from more from afar than you is a sense of a moment in the aging of the company where the founders decide they need to groom and bring in new people and sometimes it's from within a family mm -hmm. um, you know uh, and sometimes it's from within an artistic community and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't yeah because it's again the genetic code and the need and the want of the people who founded the company in the first place and they're staying together the commitment is in them, and you can't necessarily transmit that, or can you? I, I think you can. I mean, I think that's where that's where practice comes. That's where practice comes in. Methodology comes in. Like there's a way of working, and of course, any new person is going to add something new to it. And I think that's one way that ensembles sustain, or you know, sustain practice and sustain interest, is that you shake it up just a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, I think I was talking to Jerry Stropnicki, so all, all wise things come from Jerry Stropnicki of Bloomsburg, Bloomsburg yeah. Theater Ensemble. And, uh, and I think it was him who, who said like, you, or maybe it was Terry Grease from Irondale here in, 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 in Brooklyn. It, but, but he was one saying- One of these very wise guys. One of these guys. really wise, <laughs> great people who um, just said like, there's a moment, you know, there's a moment where you just want to work together. Right, like the, the emphasis is like, how do we just deepen this and, and you know, the, the, in this immediate circle and you really want to explore and push that as much as you can. And then there comes a moment where like, you need to look out, like you need to then go outside yourselves and think about like, who can we, now that we've deepened this and we've made this, how do we, what happens when it intersects with another community, another artist, a, another place, you know, another way of working. And, uh, and that that's when, you know, that's when the work really, you start to discover kind of what, what the work is. Oh yeah, I see, I thought you were talking about something else, which is the desire to move away from the collaborative. Uh huh. You know, so yeah. I, I had a conversation with a very dear colleague who I won't out here last week, and this is somebody who has committed a life to collaboration, teaching, uh -huh. study, work of collaboration, and in this person's older years, uh, uh, they want to basically return to visual art alone. Uh -huh. You know, yeah. it's like, yeah. I don't want to collaborate anymore. Yeah. 
and um, so there's that turning out in a way, yes. which also, you know, as a person who's both worked with ensembles and worked with play independent artists, individual artists, playwrights specifically, I can really sort of like the idea of collaborating and doing everything as a group or doing everything in a democracy or doing everything in a community <laughs> for the rest of my life. I just want to die, uh, you know, lie down and let the train run over me. It's really hard. And yet, yes. and yet when you do it, you become so much more distinct and bigger at the same time. Yes. Um, I don't know what the point of that is, except, you know, it's like something that you can really see. Like I think about it, uh, uh, a an ensemble of kind of two, yeah. Pearl Damore, Katie yeah, Pearl and Lisa perfect. Damore. It's, great it's a really good example yeah. because they're both independent artists of their own, both, uh, both playwrights, both directors, sometimes performers, and yet their work together is so distinctive that it calls up things that they each have that yes. don't appear as fully or in the same way in their own work. Yeah. Um, and so it's in a way it's easier with just the two to see what collaboration brings. Do you know then with mm. the cornerstone ensemble yeah. or mm -hmm. <coughs> something like, I mean, Mabu Minds is an example of yeah. a company that in some ways collaborated to allow each other to do whatever the fuck they pleased mm -hmm. as much as in the early days they collaborated to make theater. Do yes. you know? Yeah, no, and I think that's definitely part of it. It's like, <laughs> that's how you can get to, it lets you it lets you branch out and try something new. It lets you, like, you don't have to just be the, the actor. You can be the director, you can be the writer, you can be the lighting designer, yeah. you know? Uh, uh, and, and you can try new things, you can push yourself. Right. And, um, and it's that thing of like, like you know, you, it's the agency that you have when, self-determination I mean, is, a, is a big part of it. You know? yeah. uh, uh, um, I, I, but it, but then I also wonder about like aesthetics, like, like what, what does this work look like? What does yeah. it feel like? And, and, and there's something about when you can, when you can take that kind of risk, because you know you know that there's a group of people that, 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 that they've got your back. You know, like they will, they will keep you from falling. Or if you fall, they will, they're there to pick you up. Or, right. you know, or they're there to say like, man, that's just crap. Like, no. Right. No. Well, I would think uh -huh. especially for certain um, roles in the theater. Like I would think as an actor, there would, despite being a great sort of joy in playing lots of different things in lots of different contexts, there would be nothing as great as growing with a company of others who knew you, who you could speak several languages at once because you share an ac absolute language. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, when you see companies that have been together for a long time and you see the way actors play together, it's more exciting than anything, really. Absolutely. And they know that they can go out there and they can catch each other. Whereas, you know, I mean, I'm always interested in Kirk Lynn's relationship with the Rude Max yeah. in Austin because it's such a dynamic ensemble and their work is so particular and joyful and crazy and wild. And Kirk is credited in most cases as the playwright mm -hmm. and seems to thrive on being an ensemble mm -hmm. member, a, a artistic director, sure. as well as a playwright, and yet how different than going to your room and writing a play, even based on totally. what you witness in rehearsal. I mean, thinking about, <coughs> about that, like, like one of the most amazing things I've ever seen in my entire life is the method gun that the Rude Max yeah, created. Yeah, talk about that, will you? And so, like, the, the, they kept, you know, as, as I understand the story, and, and can you please, Rude Max, correct me if I'm wrong, um, is that they, um, they kept getting questions about their methodology and their practice. And they were, you know, like, they didn't really have, they didn't really feel like they had one. They just kind of, they got in a room together and did what they do. Right. And Being so... who they are. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so, so they created this piece about a, a fictitious... Um, guru, acting teacher, uh, 
and and it's about a group of people who uh, devote themselves to that to the the methodology, the practice that that she has created, and uh, and the whole thing is that they're they're doing they're working on a production of Streetcar Named Desire, without Stella, Blanche, Mitch, and um, Stanley. <laughs> so like it turns out that you can do the entire play twice in like the span of like ninety minutes. Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, when you take out those four characters, but it's brilliant, and they, but it gets to me like it, it gets to that uh, like they wrestle with legacy and practice and methodology and what is your commitment to like maintaining a way of working? Where does the individual come in to push against that? When is it? When does it? Does it just become artificial at a certain point of now you're just checking boxes of this is how we do it and this is the moment where this is the moment where we all do this and this is the moment where we all do that yeah and and how and 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 it, it gets to the personal lives of like what it means to commit right to a, a group of people and the dis- well what it means to commit to keeping each other alive too and awake and to new possibilities yeah. To challenge and it's you. beautiful and it's brilliant and mm-hmm. it's it's like seriously like one of the best yeah. like one of my like things that I just hold on as like amazing, amazing and it has yeah. that amazing um, uh, and, uh, the audience ending, thing oh yes where you have to fill out something and then it's it shows used up on the, the, yeah it shows up on the screen at the end yeah no it's interesting because I think about uh, working with playwrights I think about voice and uniqueness a lot and yet. For me, my life changed when I got to college. I went to a small college in Iowa, and I had a teacher there, a guy named Sandy Moffat, who had spent the prior summer studying with the Manhattan Project, Andre Gregory and the Manhattan Project, um, who were, you know, their famous Alice in Wonderland, among other things. And um, he gave me a book on the open theater, a book about the living theater, um, he gave me theater, a Yale theater magazine, the drama review, all yeah, things. Yeah. I mean, I came out of the musical theater and did, you know, like <laughs> TV commercials for car salesmen <laughs> in Chicago. And um, suddenly, you know, and then I went and studied with the performance group, and it was a really interesting moment. It was Richard Schechner and Jerry Rojo was the designer. They had been working on Mother Courage, we're starting this Marilyn project about Marilyn Monroe. Um, we saw their Tooth of Crime, and I- amazing work. And then I subsequently saw several projects that they did. As Liz- Elizabeth LeCompte and Spalding Gray, who incidentally I thought Spalding Gray was like the greatest transformational actor I had seen mm. to date at that time, before he started doing the monologues, they were starting to branch out into their performance work that became the Worcester group and but to see that sort of moment and to see I mean the work of the performance group which was so kind of like audience environmental rough we're all there together you feel the textures of the work and then to see the clean technological diffracted or refracted work of the perf- of the Worcester group yeah develop over years of that kind of like intimate, um, heady play between the participants and the kind of extraordinary, I mean, there was a a kind of almost a mess, a natural mess to the um, uh, stagecraft of Richard Schechner. And then Elizabeth LeCompte, I mean, has any American director ever mastered the stage and designed more than she has? but with those actors, which started out as the guys, yeah. you know, and then ult- over time, like Kate Falk becomes the heart of that company and Peyton Smith for that yeah. long period of time. Um, but that each of those perform, and now I'm getting all excited and my, you know, my it, heart's pain. Yes. It's like the, they are all so great individually and together they astonish. Yeah. And yet it's very rarefied, do you know? Yeah, and 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 and, and th- that like like when you to go back where we started, like why why ensembles, yeah. like why this? It's that like yeah. you can get that in a way that I don't, 
I don't see it in other you ways can't. of making theater. Yeah. And there's beautiful things in other ways of making yeah. theater. Like, don't get me wrong. I mean, the, not not dichotomies, you know. Yeah. But, but and we'll talk about some. Yeah. yeah. And but but that, it's it's it's. It's mind blowing. It's it's beautiful. It's complex because it's so hard to do. Um, yeah. And so 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 there's a there's a there's a and I hope we, we can can keep talking as we kind of get further into this. Uh, I think about like virtuosity. Yeah. And and uh, especially with ensembles and like. What does virtuosity look like in the collective? Is is has right. been a long time kind of question in my mind, and I don't I don't think we have time to really. Well, like when we get to I think community work and civic engagement, I think that becomes a real big question too. Yes, what yes, is the role of Yes, but I'm thinking about it specifically when we, when we start to talk about solo. Oh, okay. Because I think about like how we can see in virtuosity in the individual Great. versus in virtuosity in the collective. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and maybe we can kind of Great. as a teaser for it. what's coming up next. <laughs> Uh, is a conversation about uh, in solo individual creators, playwrights, uh, and the art and aesthetics of working that way. Great, cool. Um, but finish your thought though about virtuosity. Now we have we have five minutes. We have, uh, <laughs> I mean, no I, questions. If you have I, questions, I, throw them at us, please. Yeah. Um, uh, or comments. We'll take them all. Uh, I think it's the. I, I worry. I worry that virtuosity is harder to it. I feel like um, there is a collective virtuosity that is only as good as its weakest part. Mm -hmm. that, that because it's a collective, um, you, you adjust and you adapt to the other things around you. And so it's harder to it's harder to step out because the, the whole idea is that you are together, that you're one. And, yeah. and so it makes me, I, I often, you know, like I, I, when I was at NET, a common critique was, well, it's just not as good or the ensemble's work just, it's a lot of mediocre, mediocre work. And, and, um, of specific ensembles or generally? Uh, generally, of like the, of the form. Of this way of working leads to mediocrity, not to excellence because um, because uh, uh, it's it's there's no because it, it's not always about the individual stepping out and and excelling like it's about the collective. Yeah. No, I mean like, this is like and, and as I say this, I'm aware that it is a sometimes criticism. It is sometimes criticism, yeah. and there's so many examples of, of other things, right? Yeah. But but just in the in the, uh, trying to get to a deeper conversation of aesthetics and virtuosity, yeah. like um, how how um, how do we look at virtuosity in um, in 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 this context? Right. And what does that look like? Is it is it about? Um, it's not necessarily about the individual. And so how, how does the, the, the whole rise up? And you know, right. as you pointed, like with our two examples of like Method Gun and the work of Wizard Group, like clearly you can, and we can point yeah. to a lot of other ensembles, but do we look different? Does it look different? Well, I think it does. I mean, I think it looks and it feels different. And part of that is the challenge that is posed in the moment of, from one ensemble member to another, yes? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, uh, I mean, I think about, so when you think about speed, acceleration, and precision, and I think about the Worcester group, yeah. I'm like, who can keep up with them yeah. except each other? Yeah. Or I think there's this moment in a piece of, the, of Double Edge um, that I remember, Once a Blue Moon, that piece where we're in like their I don't know, is it a barn? It's a very mm -hmm. close barn structure and you're up on uh, wooden bleachers and some little balcony mm -hmm. and there are people swinging through the air, mm -hmm. you know, on these things that people <laughs> swing on <laughs> and um, then there's this singing happening that I can only kind of, I can't even, uh, I can't even describe it except to say it's like, living inside the Bulgarian women's choir or something yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah. And this moment where this activity is happening and this singing is surrounding you, and I'm like, I could see this every night of my life, 
but nobody could do this just in a four week rehearsal period. You can't. And you it's like that, that, remix, that, like, like that ending where like, there's this pendulum swinging. And they're avoiding that What's and happening? They're, they're dancing. Yeah, and, and, and you realize that everything that they had been creating throughout the whole piece suddenly gets done in this moment and it's transcendent. Yes. Yes. And it's a, it's like virtual. It is like virtuosity. And there are virtuosity. years of work that go into it in some Completely. way. Completely. And you can only do that. Like that would never happen, at least not with that degree of grace and skill and, and daring. Beauty. Daring, yes. really. Yeah. And like, and that, 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 that you get that in the collective and you, you get that. And, and I yeah. will say like, there's as many times where it doesn't work. Yeah. Where the experiments are like, they're fine. Yeah. And it's maddening. Exactly. Yeah. But but then you have these moments that are just incredible, and yeah, of course you have to you just have to do that some yeah. more because yeah. you have to go see more. More and more. Hey Janice, thank you so much for your comment. Uh, thank you for watching. <laughs> okay, so we are now going to break um, for lunch. For lunch. And come back at one, and we're going to be talking about solo voice. The Art of the Playwright. Um, and we want to remind you of our May Day Challenge. So if you are eager to have a conversation of your own, which we hope this will um, encourage you to do, um, let us know at the art part at howround.com or through uh, hashtag howround or on the howround um, uh, Facebook page that you are signing up to do to take our art part <laughs> May Day challenge because we're feeling a little vulnerable out here <laughs> and we need some ensemble. Other people. <laughs> yes, yes. Okay. Awesome. Thanks, Thanks Mark. See you in a little. You.